our cameraman, and we will be going down into the plant soon. We are alongside the main office on Bailey Road. This picture is being taken from the front of the Chris City Bank building. This bank was put in in, 19, in the 1920s and was the main place for cashing checks on payday for the employees of Pittsburgh Plate Glass Company and PPG Industries. PPG Industries this month has closed the operation in Crystal City. We are down here today to take pictures of the Works 9 plant of PPG Industries. This recently closed out 100 years of operation of glass making in Crystal City. We are here as authorized representatives of the Crystal City Historical Society to record this day for the future descendants. This is the corridor of the Labor Relations Department at PPG Industries. It's the home operations of all labor insurance that the men went through. The employment office, even in 1935, was in the basement just behind me. We have insurance offices, labor relations office, where you put in your application for employment, where you get your pink slips cashed in at the end of employment. This was for, uh, formerly one of the labor relations office. You can see by the cardboard boxes here, that the material has all been loaded into boxes and prepared to be carried out. The red dots on the furniture here are put, hit, uh, put here for liquidation. Some of these files will be shipped out, others of them will be sold on the spot. and a copy machine. All these are the tools and equipment in all offices in the modern day world. Right, duty and forth work. That's a Jim Levin on your right. And not too many of these characters left down here. That's old Artie there in the middle. We used to call him Artie. He was kind of wild and a little bit of everything. A good natured old boy, but sometimes he was pretty, pretty much of a hard head and everything else going on with it. And this is a Mr. Sweet. They called him Bug. <laughs> but anyhow, he was a truck mechanic and all this and that. Uh, I guess he done all right. He hung on to the job and he's still here and there's not too many of them left, but that's the way it goes. Yeah. Jim, he was so of you win know. some, you lose some. <laughs> this is C.H. Uh, Siminski. He's sent in here for the, the shutdown. He's not normally a worker here. and. We're taking his picture along with the rest of the pictures that we're trying to get done here and the offices and stuff for historical services and, and stuff like that. They may have them at the library where they can put them on the VCR and, and let individuals see what we're taking. If you don't like it, we're sorry about that. We're doing probably the best we can do. This is a wage and payroll office. You really didn't get your money here. You, that's where they figured up how much you was going to get. And in the long run, they sent it down stairs on payday for you to pick it. This is the office. Nobody here. Really, there's nobody any place. You really want to get down and figure it out. They're all gone. There was a few there that you saw the picture of, Jim Laban, Artie Dittmer, and Sweet. 
they're still here they're shipping out uh, other than that there's not a whole lot of activity we're trying to get the offers first so that's the way it goes these are a few more of the offices They're really pretty close together and kind of small, so it makes it kind of bad for us to... There's Mr. Cooper. He's uh, yeah, one of the me. last few here. Uh, Heard Mr. Miller standing down there at the end. That's where we used to come in, and they'd have somebody sitting in this little spot here. You come in there and get your payday, payday and, and we were going to take a, a picture of just the opposite side where they come in the door to get your pay. There's Mr. Sweet. He went upstairs to get a dolly. They're moving machinery, computers, calculators, water fountains, and everything out of here so they can, uh, I guess, get ready for the auction. I don't know what... This is a door into the basement section where you used to come in to get the payday. There's got a scooter sitting on the outside out there. Uh, they rolled up down to pick up some of the equipment that is in here they're going to move out. Okay, Artie, load her up and get her out of here. Okay, Bobby. Take a hold of something, sweet. Act like you know what you're doing. You now Bobby. you're going. Come on, Jim, hold up old Glory. I'm going I'm to leave the guard in here so she can get in the okay. picture with me. <laughs> she got the computer over there. There's uh, Jim Laban coming out with the dollies. Empty. Nothing left on it. Goodness sake, boy, they emptied that out in a hurry. There's Jim Laban and his bunch of home stuff out now. He's the driver of the truck. And for some reason or other, he might as well be on the picture all the time. He don't want to move out of there. He's just hanging in there. I'm Robert Schmieder. We have permission to go around taking these pictures for a historical society, myself and Don Miller. We took a few pictures of, of what was left here, of the people moving some of the computers and stuff out. And I'm taking a picture from outside in front of the parking area in front of the main office that was here. Uh, there's not too many parks here, but there is a few more um, parks down in the uh, other area. That says uh, that's no public access area. Uh, the part that you see in the background there is uh, the old car that had brought the electric in. It's way up there. Used to have to go up there and clean bird pigeon spreads and stuff off the top of there. Oh, it was uh, quite some job to climb them steps and think about coming back down. Coming back down wasn't as bad as it was going up, but it was was kind of bad anyhow, and there was all the steps going up. I guess maybe there must have been a thousand of them the way it seemed. Uh, quite a number of them. This is a parking lot that they have now. The part that was in the background is where they had the offices and purchasing and stuff like that in the last few years. It wasn't originally in that department there. That was more or less a GM and P grinder and polisher offices. And going over in this, this part over here was where they they brought chemicals in for polishing the grass and grinding and such as that. And this is part of the upper part of, uh, I think this is where they, just from outside, where they put the grinder plates on the wheels to grind the glass and go over a little farther that's within the grinder department then we we'll come back over here and we're going to look at this little building here the only reason I'm going to look at this little building is it's where they housed the is where they housed housed the ambulance whenever they had an ambulance and we're going around here there's railroad tracks coming in there as you can probably see them here and this little gate here, we had a fire truck in there. And the people that was on the fire department, so many of them could leave out of the factory and go and take a, a fire if they had one in town or something or other. And we had a little scooter we rode on. I don't know if we're ever going to get a picture of that scooter or not because they moved it out. and It belonged to the Crystal City Fire Department originally. Oh, 
This is a back picture of the hospital area. It was more or less a, a first aid station and such as that. They had officers in it, and if you got hired to uh, go to work, you had to come down and take a physical leg, took the physicals in there, and, and such as that. They had several doctors on the uh, outfit that came around and took the employees' uh, examinations and such. And looking at those two pillars there on the corner is the, in the Grace Presbyterian Church yard, which we used to belong to Pittsburgh. This is part of the office building. It, uh, it's almost obsolete. It's one of the last, last trucks coming out. Load with glass, I imagine, from over in the ware room where they load it to send it out. It says uh, uh, Cox Trucking Company. And the part on to the left there, the building there, that is presently the guard department there. It was a storeroom at one time, and it was a, a first aid station. It was a, a just about anything that came along. You had to go through there in the later years to check your cards in. They had the time cards in there and everything, and we'll probably be in there. This little shed you see here is uh, uh, what they called fire sheds. They had fire hoses in them and sometimes they had a little wagon with fire hose on reels and they would run over and get a hold of them and run down if, if they had a fire someplace and, and went on down through there. And if you go ahead and look at this sign through here, it says visitors only. And you go over a little farther, they've changed this around a little bit. We would unlock this gate here. We had a fire department had a key to this. They don't lock that gate and swing it open and come on out with the fire truck. Later years, they put one on electric and, and let the people go out that way. We're on the outside of the fence yet looking in. If you would see the building in back, uh, we're running into what they call the, the new carpenter shop right there. So that will take care of that part. In the vicinity where the cars are parked up there, used to be the checking office. You came down and, and went in the checking office and checked your card in to come to work. You, they also had the pay department in there late, uh, before we had it over in the main office. And they moved it over there after they tore this building down. It was a beautiful building, but uh, they tore it down anyhow. So, And then there's a person coming out now for some reason or other. Uh, then this sidewalk coming down through here, you see a lot of a lot of places that look like maybe there's a railroad track there. That was a railroad crossing sign there at one time. And we came on down this sidewalk over on this side over here, came down into the plant. And those were just uh, more or less uh, entrance doors. They stored glass inside of this building here and everything else and went on. Uh, they loaded glass out on railroad cars. They had this door here. They would raise this door and bring a railroad car in to load their glass on to take it in and put it on the railroad and then I think you can still see part of the railroad coming out of there. That was the only piece of a railroad that is, is left in in this part of the building unless they have some inside which I, I really don't know. And also that sidewalk over there was another way you could come down. That was people worked in the ware room and GMP and places like that. They came down and went went through the the place where I mentioned was the guard area and then uh, first aid station, storeroom and stuff. Uh, before that they just went on down whenever they checked in up at the front where the parked cars were at. This was uh, entrance that came into the factory in later years. They put a board up there tell you how many man hours you worked. And in the process of working so many man hours they give you a, a, a bill cap, a necktie, or something like that as a honor gift. There's a sidewalk that you can see coming down the steps and everything. And, uh, the sidewalk was ice up in the winter time so they put antifreeze in a pump and pumped antifreeze down through copper tubing in into the sidewalk, which melted the sidewalk off and made it safe for people to walk down through there. This was a special glass they made. They call it solar bronze, I believe, uh, one or another. 
It was something to reflect the, the sunlight back off of her, maybe the, the later mirror glass that they made and sprayed. I really couldn't tell you offhand, but uh, it was a glass. And you can also, if you look in there, you can see your uh, photographer. See him taking a picture right there? That's old Bobby. Bobby Sleater. Yeah. I must be running a little slow for my friend Mr. Miller. He's out looking for me there at the entrance to the guard department. This here was a sort of restricted area in through here. This was for doctors only. If the person got hurt and they had to call the doctor in to, to check on them, uh, they called the doctor in. He had a, a spot to park any time he come down here, regardless of what time it was, when it was, or where it was. That was a special parking place for them and the nurse. This is a guard department, watchman, or whatever you want to call them. In the good old days, we had our own people down here as watchmen. We had uh, Clyde Link and uh, Heine Grass, uh, Norman Grass, Tom Ramsey, a few other odd and ends. Uh, uh, now, uh, being that we don't have too many people around here, uh, we're not going to uh, need too many people around here. This is one of the lady guards again. We had lady guards for a, a while. Uh, Pittsburgh did. Uh, older, older ones that had a little more seniority to get some of the better jobs. Uh, if we're fading out here, that's because the lighting is poor, right in that area there. <laughs> and I work here at PPG as a guard. I'm a site supervisor, and I've been here for two and a half years. Good, for you. I was here about 41 and a half years, maybe 42. <laughs> so just look what you'd have forward to if they wouldn't be going to tear this place down. This is her cohort. I don't know who that fella is, but... Uh, I'm Jim Dowdy. I'm a guard. I've been here for five months, six months. Oh, you're a new man, just like the rest of them here. <laughs> yeah. I air-conditioned this plant, uh, or this uh, office here, years ago, what they call the good old days. I was... Uh, uh, sheet metal worker. I did the uh, sheet metal work and put the registers in and stuff like that. They're uh, pretty dirty in here now, but in the length of time that I've been out and not getting any money to buy anything with, uh, they're really not too bad uh, for considering how long it's been here. This plaque here is a replica of the order that was issued for the first order of Sungate 200 coated glass, March 11, 1985. This plant would not be in operation. This is just a, a safety thing they got in the office here. We're going to pan down through the wall, going down into the other end down at the end. You saw the time racks where they had the time cards, which is. It looks like it's pretty damn empty to me, I don't know, but it uh, don't look like there's a whole lot of cards in there. And we're going down to the end where that door is open, that used to be uh, the nurse's department there. And you went in there if you had a sore finger or a black eye or something else, and she tried to take care of it. These were the, the clocks for checking in and out. They checked in on one side and out on the other. Sometimes they'd do it in a hurry, sometimes it took a long time to get out. And then sometimes they checked your dinner bucket when they come out. That was the bad part of it. This was a strict uh, sign here. Safety glasses and foot shoes. Uh, we were going to come down this morning. I had on a pair of uh, light tennis shoes or whatever you call them. I said, huh, you can't come in there in them kind of shoes. You know better than that. But uh, I finally got a different pair on and got in here. and. This is, uh, was the checking in and out department here, also the, the place where the nurse stayed, the first aid station and, and uh, such as that. We're not going to get too much in here, but uh, if we don't get going, we're... we're this is uh, where you went into the building, that there is a, a fire alarm. You pull the handle down on the fire alarm and, and push the button in. And we're going to try to focus in on it and tell you about the 
the alarm system I had here, which is not going to work too good. It's uh, too much here. I believe it says 411. It would, a whistle would blow four times. One, two, three, four, and we'll go one, one. Oh, it was a terrible sound of noise, and that's what they they uh, uh, use for the fire system down there in case anybody uh, found a fire or someplace that they needed the fire to fire the from uh, going right into the door where you used to go into the factory. This was a, a GMP polisher and grinder locker room. Uh, the polisher didn't like to get around the grinder and the grinder didn't like to get around the polisher because uh, the polishers had rouge on them and nobody wanted that red rouge because it sucked into you and a little bit of everything else. This was upstairs where the the grinder department's at. We'll try to get up there sooner or later. This was a transformer for the electric that they put in in later years. Uh, I don't know what's in the locker room anymore. Maybe we'll get in and see it. Maybe we won't. This is a mural on the wall inside, right inside the door when you come into the factory. It was a, sort of attractive. The carpenters put this up years and years ago whenever, before I left out of here, uh, it's more or less in a wallpaper deal. Uh, it is kind of nice looking. In later years, instead of having the storeroom out where the, the guard department is at now, uh, this was a, a storeroom. You come here and, and went to this window here and told them what you wanted and then they would go back if they had it and bring it to you and then you could get it to where you were going the best way you could. And this was the entrance going over into the factory, which will be there before long. It's going to be quite a tape here. As I stated before, you can see the sign says, Man, that was a locker room for the polisher and grinder department. Polishers were supposed to be on one end so they didn't bother anybody, but uh, they were all in one locker room, half of them was in one half, the other. This is the wall going over back to the mural again. Uh, we're going to take a little picture of it and then on down to the entrance of the... We're not going to... We're just going to pan the area and, and move on out because uh, we may run out of battery or, or something other. And there's our... Our number one priority was... Here comes the loner. And not too many of these people down here anymore. But they're... They're moving stuff out and in the process of moving stuff out. Well, this one used to be in the storeroom area right over on the right side. They stored stuff for the storeroom and such. Uh, another mural on the, on the wall. You can either go this way and go down through the, the oil room or uh, storage department, tank department, or machine shop. Anywhere you want to go, you can go either go this way or go go around. They didn't prefer you go to These old hoses provided protection for all the plant over while they waited for the big truck to get there. This is a standpipe deal, has a valve on it, the, the uh, hose is connected here, and all you had to do is grab the nozzle and run with it, wait for somebody to turn it on your water here. Well, this number 12 area here is more or less an area where they show the wood patterns and send them out whenever they get a casting made of something or other and they stored all type of patterns in there that uh, made for gears and uh, uh, different things that uh, was used in the plant. They had to send to a foundry, have them made out of cast iron and everything else and in the long run it, uh, uh, they just had it locked up and whatever they needed a pattern they'd send it to the outfit and get a uh, bid on it how much they wanted to pay for it. In the back of them doors down there, they used to have a, 
in back of the doors down there, as you can see, a uh, uh, walk-through door, and then the other doors up with uh, yellow and black lines on them. I don't know how they're going to turn out on the camera. But it's where they stored uh, uh, spare rolls for when they were made glass in the old tank, and they wrapped them all with a, a special rubber and bandered them to keep them from getting dirty and everything. They took them over to the machine shop and turned them down. And in the process of turning them down and everything, uh, they put a, what they call a neural on the, on the rolls. And in the process of the neural, that would pull the glass after once it got started through and just keep pulling it out of the tank and, and sending it on down the layer. If we've got enough time, we're going to go up in that department and, and see what's left up there. Probably not enough left up there to say anything about, but that's, that's what the uh, area we're in now. In later years, they, they, after the restaurant closed, they had more or less uh, machines and everything else for for people to eat. They had a microwave oven and a uh, few machines with uh, soup, with sandwiches, cold sandwiches. And this is uh, where they had that in this, this little area here. And before, when I talked about the, the storage of glass, uh, this is uh, uh, the storage area where they stored the glass, loaded it on the railroad cars, and, and hauled it out of here and, and everything else. I can remember, oh, years and years ago, a person right in that area got run over with a park truck. This is, uh, I guess, the area where they're going to have a auction or whatever they're going to have now. It's a storage of all the spare motors and stuff they had for different drives or different machinery and stuff that, that they used in the plant back in the old days whenever they had a lot of machinery going. Uh, you've seen some of the pictures that we had, uh, the machines were driven off of one shaft. Well, everybody had a, a machine, they had a motor on it, man. And they had old spare motor after spare motor. Most of this stuff in here now is obsolete and everything else. They're getting rid of it for auction and you get rid of it and you sell it. This is a cap with a bucket on it. I made many of them buckets in my days. I'm Bob Sleater. And Don Miller's my uh, cohort on this uh, film taking. Uh, they picked a uh, collar up and put it on the belt or put it in the elevator whenever they wanted uh, uh, stuff. They also used it for cleaning snow off the road and, and all just all different odd and ends. Then down to, on down through here is where previously they stored glass, but uh, they've got rid of all the glass. There used to be a, a pump down here at the end. They told me to do something to it one time. I went down to done it. And, and they thought they were going to have a flood. This is uh, part of the substation area that we took previously. You can hear the hum in there. That is a hum coming out of the transformers. We're going to pan down through here and everything. It, back up was a more or less a substation where they had the electric coming in if anything went wrong. This was a, a truck that they called hopper trucks. They hauled big hoppers of color to glass, sand, dirt, anything you wanted to haul. You hold them in there and then they dump them. My friend Don found this sign. He had to put it up and get a picture of it. This was where he worked the uh, last few years. He also took a apprenticeship in the machine shop. This was uh, his department here, the instrument shop. He just liked to stand there and I think reminisce more or less. This is uh, the old instrument shop. It's still in operation Fort Way. Uh, this is where Don spent his last years in here. I don't think he sat at that desk too much, but he was in this department, and this was a, a storage rack for different uh, uh, PC outfits, uh, boards, uh, instruments, and whatnot, and on down through there, and in the back, on down there bumming around trying to get homesick or something. These steps went upstairs to where they had a, a storage rack of good stuff. They overhauled uh, uh, television receivers and monitors and such as that. Then later on they got some other people in to take the, the ones people uh, were leaving out and take their places. It is uh, 12 o'clock right now. You can hear the, the whistle blowing. It used to blow 7, 7.30, 8 o'clock, 12, 12.30, 1 o'clock, 4, 
430 and I don't think it blowed at 5. It may have blowed at 5, but as I said, I don't really remember if it did or not. Don's still back there looking around, getting homesick. I think he might hire in. That clock there is, is uh, uh, on some other kind of time, rather than the time it's on right now. They probably been so busy with what they got here now, uh, taking that, that they don't have time. There's another clock, got a different time on. So they got a lot of time down here for some reason. Uh, some of these comments are, are, I don't know what you would say. Don had to go upstairs and see what he could find up there. Uh, there he is up there bumming around. See him in there? These are camcorder pictures. This is looking at the door coming into the instrument shop. It's pretty bright out there, so you're not going to get too much on that. You can see down through there, but that's that's about all. And this is uh, another view of the equipment and stuff that they had in, the supplies, resistors, condensers, clocks, timers, and whatnot, uh, batteries, uh, tubes, uh, and all kind of odd and ends that uh, they used to repair the different stuff with here in uh, later years whenever they started having instruments and, and stuff. Before that, they never had uh, an instrument shop. They just had uh, a more or less uh, person out of the machine shop went down and done what he could. If he could fix it all right, if he couldn't, then they'd, I guess, go ahead and get another one to take care of it. A bunch of capacitors of different sizes and values and stuff that uh, uh, they blow out more often than others. and. They had a lot of them for spares. Most of them, uh, I think, uh, in later days, uh, were just more or less a plug-in type. And you just pulled them out and put another one in and went on about. This is uh, oxygen, acetylene storage area. They've had this area all over the factory. Uh, it used to be at the storeroom. It used to be down on the opposite end of the the machine shop and every place else. And this here was uh, uh, the old steam power house. Uh, the part you can see going up the side of the building there, that took plaster up into the storage bin for the, the GMP, the grinder and polisher. Where this here place is that they had a big silo that they stored their, their plaster in whenever they used plaster in the plaster days. but. Uh, later on, they come out with a great invention, the float tank. They never need to polish it or grind it or anything else. They just went ahead and made glass. This was uh, uh, originally the old steam powerhouse in here. Uh, they had a lot of steam equipment and stuff like that uh, all in this uh, building here. Part of it's tore down. It's not. Uh, they just used it more or less now in the uh, later years for a storage area. And as I said on another film, uh, this was a belt elevator coming from the tank department for a, a busted glass and everything. They run a railroad car in there the biggest part of the time. If it had any busted glass, well, it come out through there and come down. It had a longer chute in it with rubber on it, so if you walked out the door, the, the glass wouldn't splash all over the place and everything else. And they lowered it into railroad cars and took it back to the back part of the factory and stored it on the ground for future use. Uh, then these hoppers that you can see there, right behind the speed limit sign, was what they picked up with that truck that I previously showed you. I called a, a truck for carrying the hoppers. And then we we'll go back over here, and this is uh, some of the stuff they have tore out now, being that the, they're in the process of shutting the factory down. There's a old, old electric shop there where Don is standing. That's where they went in the door for the electric shop. The ceiling's falling off the building in there now. They haven't used it for so long. They asked us not to go in there, so uh, we're not going to see too much of that. And that's a, another view of the, the transformers and stuff where they had the electric. That one there said metal only. Some of them said glass only. Some said call it. Some said different types of glass. And on down the line.
for one or two particular men. He was only allowed to run that when you're taking your apprenticeship and they put in time with it, but the man that oh, ordinarily run it stood right over you. That was a Hartman? What was his name? That Wimp, ran that. Uh, Wimpy. Uh, Wimpy, Wimpy, Wimpy Holman. Holman. Wimpy Holman run that yeah, machine Wimpy and Wimpy Holman he took care of it like it was a baby. Oh gosh, he was a uh, uh, dinner. And then we went on up here uh, <coughs> to uh, one of the bigger lathes. Uh, I don't know if that was one of the biggest ones in there where they turned the uh, uh, tank rolls, or, or they had another yeah, that, one. That was a big uh, tank roll. That was uh, the one that they put the neural on, as I had yeah. told you before. That, uh, Final they, finish of neurals. Then you come back over here a little bit to your left, you can see uh, a safety sign there on it. That was a hydraulic press that you used to press gears on or took them off or whatever you had to do. And you're going up here a little further, and, and you see in the process there, uh, a planer table. That was a small version of the one we just saw that, that I said was one of the largest ones in the world. There's not too much machinery in this department anymore. That was one of the, the planers that uh, was in this department. I think they had some more. Uh, uh, who, uh, who was running the milling machine? He was so upset when they made him start going out on maintenance on weekends. He lived up there on 8th Street. And he, uh, he was hired in for that job, and it was his job. Oh, uh, yeah, I know who you're talking about. But, uh, uh, this was a film machine and uh, everything. Uh, the person that Don was talking about, every time he, after he retired and was around town, he, he'd come down and come in and, and talk to different ones and everything. This was the large drill press that they had uh, to drill uh, big holes. I mean, they had big holes. You can see a... Uh, uh, one of the bigger drills in there. We have a little one over here too, didn't we? Yeah, they had all kinds of little things in there. The lathe has all been uh, sold uh, out. A small uh, planer. Uh, no, they got a little small lathe over on the other side there in the corner there. Uh, I uh, made a bolt and nut and such uh, in order to get a little extra money on the money, the job I was on. And, you had to make a bolt of some kind for up in the GMP and a uh, nut to fit it. You had to cut threads and, and a little bit of everything. That was, that, that lathe was run by a man they nicknamed Mid Midnight Mac. The man came here and about all he'd done was run a lathe. Mac McMullen. Mac McMullen. And he worked midnights all the time. Somebody, that was where he somebody laid. Somebody left their uh, toolbox here. This was uh, later years, they, they had a, a, behind the, the part you see in front, that was a threading machine. They threaded bolts and you could thread pipe on it and everything else and, and uh, uh, it would uh, kind of take care of different uh, odd and ends that uh, they had. Then in the back, in the, they had a storage rack for nuts and bolts and screws and whatever. Anybody wanted, they could go over in that rack and get it. They wouldn't have to go up store them and get anything. We're going to go and pick another pan of this shop here, and, and then we're going down the other way. That's a big drill press, and you can see how large it, the drill was that they were using. This was an electric shop, such, in the shop. They uh, repaired motors, done whatever was necessary, and everything else go along with it, rewired them. Uh, Mr. Fenwick was a, a lead man whenever I was in, uh, and then his son took over. They were both uh, real good electricians, and uh, Mr. Mayhew was uh, also in the department. Uh, he was the head of the department uh, years and years ago, him and Mr. C.J. Perry, uh, they both uh, uh, ran the electric department. And on up to the end there, we're not going to get up to the end there, was where they had the pipe shop. They had the uh, pipe fitters that went around and done all the pipe work and everything in the fact they took care of the steam lines and, and so forth. Uh, I thought maybe we were going to get to the carpenter shop, but I don't think we're going to make it. These stairs are, are 
added later on in, in years. Uh, they never had the locker rooms upstairs before, but they added a, a more or less a, a foreman office and, and engineer office, a tinker room and, and things in the back side. Above it, they put a locker room for people to change their, their clothes. On that end there, which was the north end of the shop, they had the carpenters, the pipe fitters, and mostly electricians. And then in this end here, on down the road, uh, this side, on the south view that we're taking a picture of now, uh, was a machine shop. At one time, they had 325 men working in the machine shop alone. And that was a lot more men than they've had in this factory working in totally in the last year. We're still in the machine shop area. Uh, this is a big bandsaw that was in here at one time. Uh, along the wall right through here was a, a little lathe, a machine shop lathe that they worked on in, and the room behind it was uh, originally a, a rigor department. Uh, they took all pictures, all the uh, heavy work. Uh, nobody else wanted dirty stuff and everything. They made cables and in that little room there. They kept their chain blocks come along and sit. Then went on down and you get behind the, the saw and look in the other department. In later years, that's where the, the tin shop was at. That's where I was employed for many years. And we had at one time a 15 sheet metal workers in here. There's uh, only one piece of equipment left in there, which is a, a bandsaw welder. I don't know if they know what it is or not. I'm going to ask them. And if they have a sale, I'm, I would like to buy it just for more or less a, a keepsake. And you go on down in, into the area, right in that area to your left, before you get to the hood, you see a, a up up there. Uh, that's where they had the tool room. Uh, you've probably seen pictures of Bob Fulham and stuff on the other pictures that we've taken. And they showed that uh, Bob Fulham was that's where he hung out. Uh, I see gum on the floor. We used to solder a, a nickel or a penny or something on a on a roofing nail, drive it in the floor, and people come along and try to pick them up in here on the fourth floor. The reason they had the wood floor to make it easier to walk on. Then we're going down a little farther. You can see a, a hood and and such as that in the in the department. I'm trying to bring it in a little closer now. Uh, that was a, a blacksmith part. My uncle Fred Sleater worked there about 70 years. Or it may not have been 70 years, but he was up in his 70s whenever he retired and you could come to work early down here uh, back in the good old days as they had it. Uh, the hood was to take the smoke off of the, the blacksmith forges and, and stuff as that. And then you can move over to the right, right here in this area here, you can see uh, something I don't know if you would really realize what it is. It, it, that's what they call the steam hammer. Uh, you got to run the controls, one control on one side and the other one on the other side. You pull one up, you either run faster and put one on and put more steam on it. You raise one and push one, raise one and push one. Uh, the wheels right there that you see were the wheels off of the fork trucks. Uh, they would press them on there. They always done that with steam, but in later years they didn't have no steam in the summertime, so I suggested that uh, they put it on air. It didn't have the push on air, but they had the pretty good pressure on air, and they put it on there. They give me a big bonus of $10 for coming up with a general idea of putting that on. Then we go back here, and there's a supply room, and, and Mr. Dawn just uh, let one of the doors fall, if that's what you heard. That was a threading machine right there. It was a modern convenience area. It could do almost anything. Make any kind of thread you wanted if you know how to operate. 
down in back of it was a sheet metal shear. And then over on a little farther over was a, a, a drill press, another drill, a surface plate they called it. And, and this machine here that you can see, this behind the beam or whatever it is sticking out there, that was what they called a version press. It would uh, go ahead and uh, operate now this with a, a, a regular brick there. It was electric brick. The version press has gone out. Uh, this is an electric brake. It had an electric motor on it. You push the buttons up and down, and, and that was the operation of it. We're presently standing in the area that was originally, uh, in the last year's uh, sheet metal shop. That uh, machine right there, if you see, was a machine for welding bandsaw blade. If I had a, a penny for each blade that I welded on there, I'd be in real good shape to take a couple of days off and go someplace. But this here was a spot welder they got in later years, water cooled. It done a fairly good job, but it got out of hand and everybody run and kind of tore it up. I'm going down here and look at the, the coveralls hanging on the on the wall there. That's a was a contamination deal. Anybody that that. Uh, uh, worked around anything uh, asbestos or anything else, they had to wear these clothes. Or they got in an air acid area or something that, where they could get it on their clothes and eat their clothes up. They took them coveralls off and throw them away. That's what they used up at uh, uh, the beach up there at the area where they had to come contamination of the oil from the Bliss Oil Company. This was my area where I worked in a tin shop. The only thing left there is this piece of rubber on the floor. Uh, that you would stand on or walk on to more or less make your feet a little more comfortable during the day. This was one of the many cranes they had in the shop. And it wasn't really many, it was uh, one of two. They had a heavy one which made a lot of noise when it run and this was it. But it would lift anything up that they, they ever encountered to lift. And I'm going around and, and try to get a, another view of it. There was double change and and the uh, hoist hanging down on it were also part of it. Uh, we're gonna come in here and try to get a, a better view of it. You can see it says 45 tons. So you know it was a, a big one that it done its lifting on. Uh, it went on across and everything else. Uh, this is uh, uh, exhaust going out of this department here where the hood is at fixed and the smoke off the Blackfish Smith Forge. I don't know if there's one there or not. Uh, we'll take another look. I made that pipe and, and installed it in the later years. We're in the blacksmith area again. Uh, this is where uh, my uncle Fred Schleter worked for many years, Tony Ruff, a few other odd men people, uh, uh, Snuffy Wantland, Harry Page, uh, a person by the name of Brown, and they were helpers. Uh, Fred Schleter and Tony Ruff were the two main blacksmiths, and after Fred retired, uh, Paul Wanton took the job over. He used to always uh, uh, want to make some kind of ornamental iron stuff. This was a, a, a dangerous saw, but it would cut almost anything. You could wind up, oh, it would wind up and makes a, a terrible noise, but you could pull it down the fire and fly, and you could say, that's cut. It was already cut. And we went on around here, this was a more or less a, a welling room in there. They did special welling for for uh, Herculite tongs. They had Herculite tongs to put a, fe a special metal on them, make them hard so that they dig into the glass. And whenever they, uh, the person would sit in there, they had a little bucket of water and they put one of these little screws in it and after they had them turned down the way they want them and put a little tip on them, made a little round ball on them. And then we're going around here. This was a, a burning table. The reason we're staying so much time in this uh, department here is where uh, Don and I worked for many a year, and, and we're more or less uh, reminiscing. This is one of the old welding machines that they had. You, you pulled it around with a park truck. It, somebody's done got the wheels off of it and everything else. And one over here, well, uh, there was a person named Tessero and Siebert and somebody else oh, that oh. more or less uh, stayed in this department. and and. Uh, melted lead, they made different things out of lead and stuff. 
In 1950s, when it first came down, there was still a lot of Babbitt bearings being used around Pittsburgh. And uh, old Phil Bolt was the oldest guy that I remember that cast uh, Babbitt bearings in this area. This here was uh, another picture machine shop. It looked like they still got a, a few pieces of equipment in there. Maybe we'll sneak in there and take one. This was uh, a new lathe and two of them that they got in in the last years. I don't know what years it would be or anything else, but it was a, a real fancy machine. You could do just almost anything on it. Make a quick change or change the trucks or anything else. Lawrence Dornell uh, run that machine whenever I came in here. A uh, uh, spring or something jumped up and hit him in the eye. Put one of his eyes out, but he was a good old man on that lathe. He could really run that scutter. Bob Cullen was another one that was on there, but uh, I, I say that uh, uh, Lawrence Arnell was... Uh, then in the later years, they had the hard Keaton come in here, and uh, Freddie Benz, uh, Paul Flynn. Paul Flynn was a good man on that lathe. Now, he could he could almost make anything. That you, uh, if you could show him what you want or tell him, he'd make it. And we moved on around here in different places. They had a, a, a little vice for working on, and, and we're not going to get a very good view of this for some reason or other. Now we're getting a, a little better view. Uh, this was a, a sort of a grinder, a surface grinder. You put yeah. grinder wheels on it, and it run back and forth, and it would grind the edges on uh, some kind of uh, blades, a, a, a shear blade or whatever they had that they wanted. Uh, use in a, in a process. Cylindrical grinder. Couldn't necessarily, it's a grinder that's good enough. Made on a milling machine base. And they had a little uh, bandsaw in here over on the other side. And it was more or less a, a tool room over there. They kept all different supplies, uh, drills, saw blades, and and all kind of odd and ends of that. Uh, I'm going to show you another little picture here of a little little grinder right here on the table. Uh, they had a, a key making machine in this area. Anybody wanted a key made, uh, they had, I guess, any key that was available in the United States. They had a key that, if you had a blank, uh, they could make it. This machine you see here is, uh, if you can see it, it said 1030 on it. I guess it is going in the auction. Uh, it was a drill grinder. You set it up in the machine one way or another. In the, it had a little centering device on it. You put the drill in the in the centering device, and and the wheel that you see in front, you push that up and down, and and it would turn the the, the drill in towards the wheel, and the handle that's sticking out on the side there, right below the the sign that's on there for sale or whatever it is, danger. If you pull that handle up and down, that would change the, the, the shape of the drill. And you would, and whenever you went real fast, it'd have water coming in on it. went real fast, it burnt the drill up. Otherwise, it was a real good thing. This was one of the old welding shops. They had a welding machine in here to close the doors and then went in and did the welding and stuff. Uh, this is a uh, sheet metal tools here it says 10.22 I just told John to put the number down I, I wouldn't give him much money for them but I would like to have them and these are lockers they kept uh, welding rods in and such uh, maybe uh, some of them change their clothes in our area this is the area originally was uh, where the sheet metal shop was at back in here was the iron storage rack you could almost find any kind of iron in there, angle iron or anything else that a, a person would ever want. There was also a sheet metal storage rack, and on that back there where you see the round part and the garage door here, they had special stuff in there, tools, steel, and all kind of iron in. They kept that locked up the biggest part of the time, so it uh, didn't walk away. Sometimes stuff would get, and people would make different things out of them, rings and all kind of things, just to more or less keep them uh, occupied. And we're still down in this area. This is an old belt sander, and this is another grinder. This is a ladder going up to the, the shed there. This is a, a small uh, bandsaw, a light support here. 
uh, that there was another uh, boat machine, and here was no old, old shear, boy, it was an old one. He'd done a lot of cutting. We had that up in the, in the sheet metal shop to cut bands and make uh, the collars out of them and stuff. And, and we're going over here and see another uh, uh, old saw here. This was a, uh, one of the first saws they ever had in uh, mechanical department. Hacksaw, electric hacksaw. And this was another uh, uh, saw. Then we'll go over here and see this foot shear, which is uh, another thing. Uh, another. Uh, uh, all, but it's not all there, it's, uh, it's got some missing, and then some two inch rules, uh, which are uh, fairly nice. This is the old 10 ton crane. Uh, Hugo Gabehart ran this crane for years and years. You could run that crane down through the shop and set it down almost on anything that you had down there ready for him to pick up. Uh, then after he left out and retired and everything else, anybody that come along and said, go up and get that crane, run that crane which wasn't the safest thing to do, but it was something to do. And that was the way the operator did from This is uh, Paul Byron. He's uh, one of the few people we've run into on this ordeal here today. Uh, they used to call him Gallon Mouth back in that. He was an electrician, uh, and you can see his mouth, how, where they got that gallon. Okay. This big fan here was used down a cooling tower outside the float. The water was going through the tanks, and when it come up out of the tanks and, and dropped down through the tire, to cool off so it could recool again, these big fans was on top, and they'd blow the water down through it and evaporate the water and throw it like an air conditioner, in the, uh, and it cooled the water down for, for the uh, cooling of the tanks. This is uh, what they call the filtration department. They filtered water. Uh, made of salt water and everything else. Uh, for years and years, they furnish uh, Crystal City with water. Uh, we may not get to see too much of it in here because it's kind of dark right now, but uh, we're going to try to give you a, a good enough version of what we can of it. This was a panel board for the electric and stuff and all the pumps and everything that was later used in here. Uh, you can see it fairly good, better than I figured it was going to. Uh, going down around. That was uh, some kind of a salt and cleaner out there. They had pumps on a lot of these stands that are not pumps on them anymore. But uh, this is a general general idea. The thing you see there in front is, is not part of the boiler room. It's for a filtration plant or anything else. It's uh, just a steam cleaner that's sitting there in the way. And the two tanks in back, uh, which you can see here, uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to see that or not there. Uh, there's a sign you can probably read it to uh, be regenerated. Uh, they changed that sign, put it on different valves at different, so many hours. They go over and take a little sample out of, out of the charger there, and they had salt, uh, a different kind of uh, chemicals that uh, was added into that, and, and then it would... Uh, make the water real soft, which, which we did really have a real good soft water here and a lot better than, than what it is now, but it's, it's really not bad now. Uh, these were uh, tanks that they softened the water in. They took samples. They had chemists that, that took samples of uh, the water every so often, make sure it was uh, uh, good, clear water, good, clean, safe water to drink and everything. This was part of their filter system also. When we get up to the top, uh, they got a stainless steel pipe taking the fumes out. It had to be stainless steel because whatever fumes came off of there were poisonous and everything else. And it, uh, I had a job several times of making that pipe and putting it in there. I don't know. I, I don't think they run the plant after, or this department after I left out of here. So there's no need to worry about it now. These are... Uh, were steam generators, air, air compressors, and, and stuff. They had steam generators that they made their electric with and, and everything, and, and uh, this was an air compressor. Uh, years ago, uh, down below, uh, they put a, a double system on from one to the other, and they turned that over to sheet metal workers. It wasn't really, at that time, uh, sheet metal workers were a little heavier, and, oh, I don't know, uh, 
you know how people can get there, want to not want to do something or other. But these, these were air compressors, they're steam operated. If one of them uh, blow the pop-off valve or something in row, they made a turbo. This was another uh, compressor, steam operated, whenever they run steam. Run air compressor, compress the air, send it up in the storage tanks all over the factories that they run their air machinery with and stuff like that. This was a, a newer one that they got in. It was a electric operator, so they run it more than uh, they did the, the other ones all through the factory. This was a boiler room. These were later in converted to gas boilers. Uh, they were all coal boilers at one time. We tried to take a picture from the other end of the new boilers that were put in later on. They had big tanks up there, heated the water in and everything else, make their steam. And every summer they'd shut them down. The people would have to go over and get in them, take the scale out, uh, clean all the tubes out and everything else. It was, uh, I've done that many a times and uh, we just thought you might like to see the, some of that uh, stuff that uh, was around in different uh, areas. Uh, it's getting a little later on in the, in the day now where I'm getting a little hungry myself. I don't know how uh, darn it's getting, but it, it's one o'clock already. This scene here is in the north end of the boiler room. This is a fire pump that is hooked to the creek water system. When the fire alarm went, uh, goes in, the operator of the uh, pump room, or the boiler room operator, started this pump up. It was designed to maintain a high level of pressure on all the fire plugs within the plant. Switchboard, is that all the incoming part of the plant? That, or is that upstairs? Is that all the incoming no, part? Oh, there's upstairs, yeah. The big stairs, the big This is just DC. That's the DC this control panel. panel. This there is the 13 uh, uh, distribution panel. It had two lines of 138,000 volts coming into the plant. The transformer is transferred transform down to 13 8 went through these breakers and fed throughout the plant. All this was looped through the plant. And on the other end of this, you see the way down the end was the 2300. There was also a 2300 loop that fed uh, lighting subs, it fed the football field, it fed the uh, some of the lighting out in the Crystal City at one time, and also uh, fed down through the filtration plant when Pittsburgh used to supply electricity for Crystal City. At this time now, it's just one, the one loop of the plant is now operating. Way back when they had the fire system for Crystal City, this was the old fire alarm panel. And also, it fed up to the uh, Crystal City city building for the old city building burned down. And this thing you see down here on the left is the whistle, the old Ooh, whistle. And by releasing that, that gives a signal for where the fire was at. And they converted from this to that cabinet down there, which is now the present fire alarm system. Now this is another view of this old panel. This panel hasn't been in operation for years, but it kept it as sort of an antique uh, from back in the days of uh, when Pittsburgh supplied all the fire protection for Crystal City. And this little mechanism here is an antique. And by tripping this thing here, this chain went down and it kept blowing that whistle and giving how many pulses it told you where the fire was at. And this here, this here is a new system which does the same thing the old did, only it's a, a new modern system. And it, and when they were a, a fire alarm box is tripped, that will give you the, it'll blow the number 
of uh, where the fire is located. We sat there also still use this thing. Oh yeah, dude, bump that cable. <laughs> Boop. Yeah. Boop. 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 Okay, this was a 2300 breaker, old time breaker. What this bed was the motor generator downstairs, and that is the 2300 that drove the motor that drives the DC that generator. This has been here in existence for lots of years. And one of these, one of these is still, this is still being used at this time. If we need to work more in the MG, this would have to be used. This person uh, doing the comments on this is full gallon mountain. <laughs> that was what he was doing at full gallon mountain. Okay, look at this uh, breaker panel here. This right here, we have up here on top of this office school and hospital. That's that, keeping the old hospital up on the main uh, main road up here. And also felt fed Crystal City Grade School, high school, and football field. And uh, the old sand mine, and that, that was, uh, was taken out of service all oh, several years ago when Crystal City went on her own power. And what that is. That's a mortising machine there, Don. Yeah, I believe that's a mortising square, real machine. Yeah. Uh, the, mach the machine you're looking at now is an old mortising machine. Uh, they use that to make square holes or uh, mortising, put the boards together and such as that. Uh, this uh, other machine here was a, a router, uh, make different designs on things, and we go over and and this here machine here is this is a carpenter shop uh, the later version of the carpenter shop uh, they had another carpenter shop down on the lower end I don't know if we ever get that far or not but uh, this here was a, a planer or whatever you want to call it they run the board down to get them the thickness they want and such as that and this one over here was a sort of a, a planer also but uh, uh, it was just a small one, just to more or less knock the edges on. And this uh, background was tables. My father worked in the carpenter shop for many years with Jerry Duncan and Bill Strauss and, oh, I don't know, Jimmy Jimmy Robinson was a, a sort of supervisor of the whole department at that time. Uh, Milton Hill took over later on and, oh, they just had a numerous uh, amount of foremen. This uh, uh, table in through here and, and everything was where they make uh, straight edges and uh, squares for cutting the glass. Uh, you can see one of the squares, not very good, but you can see one of them on the wall here, hanging up. There you can get a better view of it. Uh, they had them all different sizes, two foot, three foot, five foot, six foot, eight foot, all different sizes. Uh, they made the straight edges, uh, maybe they were 15 feet long to cut the big glass uh, and then they would cut it down into smaller pieces, they used these squares or they had special sticks that they used to, if they had a, a number of glass to cut to uh, uh, one side. That was uh, in the good old days. And the, uh, the, the table that uh, is down below, down through here that you, you can see, is what they made and used for straighten the, the sticks. They were about a half inch by three, four inches wide, maybe any any length from 10 foot, 15 foot. And my dad uh, uh, made many of them stick. You straightened them and uh, planed them down to get them to a certain edge. And they had a certain uh, gauge there that they set that and, and cut the, the boards down to that edge. On this table here, you see a bunch of old time uh, wood seat lamps. Uh, we can't see them very good, but uh, uh, you can see them there. And I've said uh, more stuff about the machinery in this department. Uh, we're going on over here into the uh, workbench area and over into the uh, saw. This here was a, a, a cutting piece of machinery here. It, uh, would cut just about any kind of board that you had to cut and it was a pretty big operating saw. And we went over here to the 
the sanding machine and everything else. And it was all uh, 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 run by carpenters. They had regular carpenters that done this work. Uh, and uh, the ductwork system that you see to take the stuff outside to the dust collector. The sheet metal department made that, installed it and stuff like that. Uh, they had uh, some over in the box shop, but later on they contracted it and had new pipes made over in there. And then after they got all the pipes made, uh, they started letting people out in, in town make the boxes for them. There's a, a, a says carpenter, carpenter shop on it. It's, it's more or less a, just a hopper to throw trash in and, and stuff, but that's where it belonged to. Whenever they got it empty, they brought it back there. That was a fan to keep them cool. They didn't have the air conditioning. This was another big band, so they cut the altar or whatever was to be cut. And we'd go over to their dinner table there where they ate dinner or lunch or whatever they had. They didn't have that vacuum cleaner there then. It was a wood lathe. Uh, they made plugs and all kind of outfits there. Uh, made wooden mallets for a sheet metal shop. They made uh, uh, all kind of plugs to plug the sewers up with and everything else. Then we'd go over here and see the latest version at the head. was a Dewalt cut-off saw. It was a real handy outfit. They put a new type of ge uh, guard on there. I got involved in that job too, so uh, I've been involved in quite a few jobs. That's where we're spending more time here. Me and Don was more in this department than we was in the glass department. We're still here in a, in a carpenter shop. The door we're looking through now went into the paint shop. This was in a more modern version, added on the traction to the, the machine shop and pipe shop and whatnot on down through there and before it was down in the back of the factory uh, at the rate we're going we're not going to get there today this picture you're looking at now is a uh, way they used to bring coal into the boiler room uh, this was in later years uh, they borrowed in in pickup truck dump trucks and dumped it up there that's why the the screen is around the the part here but if you look on back down you can see a, a railroad uh, uh, stop for the railroad cars when they come in. They were bringing in on railroad cars before and, and put the railroad car there and dump it in and, and they had an elevator there and took it over upstairs into a sort of a chutes and everything and came down into the, the ballers and you either had to shovel it in in the old days and you had to have all 15 foot long shovel scoop shovel like sort of thing to pull the ashes. Uh, Fred Free, Doc Lou, and uh, Grub, and oh, I don't know any number of them that uh, worked Moore, in there. Fred Moore worked with Freddie Moore worked in there. I worked in there pulling ashes. Uh, maybe Don pulled ashes. I don't know, yeah, but there was a lot of a lot of ash pullers. That was one of the entrance jobs into the mechanical department at that time. I shoveled it out when I was in the instrument shop. I mean, the riggers. Tell me what you want to and I'll talk to you. Uh, in that area there is where the old cooling tanks used to be to cool the water for, for the tank. This is the old system here. Uh, we'll get to the other plan if we got enough time. If we haven't got enough time, well, I don't know what we're going to do, but uh, this was uh, the old tank department. Uh, they had uh, bricklayers that go in and uh, work on what they call the flues and stuff. Uh, they come up with a deal that the, if they wore an asbestos suit, this was a drain pit where they drained the glass out. They had water running in it, had a couple pipes coming in, and whenever they drained the tank, it would come out into that, that part there, and then they had a brown hoist that it dug the collar out of there and put it in railroad cars and moved it out. They had many a car load. They used to do that by hand, by jackhammer, but later on they started uh, draining it and let it run out on its own. That porch up there uh, was where you come out and cool off after you worked on a tank. But as I was telling you about the flues, they had the bricklayers to change uh, the bricks that burn up in the flues and everything. They put a asbestos suit on it and put a belt around you with a chain on it. It was really a, a great thing because if anything happened to you while you was in there, you got too hot and overcome, you had that chain on you and somebody outside to drag you out of there, whether you was a uh, uh, kicking or, or crawling. This was a, a modern boiler room. Uh, 
they added this on in later years. The other part it was on, as I said, was the boiler room, is where you pull the ashes. This here dumped its own ashes down into the sewer and run out. They had water running all the time. After so many burns, it would dump the ashes out. It was all automatic. They had a panel board here. It uh, showed you what was going on, if you had high water, low water, hot water, cold water, or whatever it was. And we went on up here. That was the elevator going from where I told you the, the coal was dumped. And they had another one up there that went into these chutes. They had a board on it or, or a stop on it or something. Whatever chute they wanted to go in, they would dump that uh, uh, coal down into that chute. And that went down into these, these uh, boilers here. It was all automatic. The part here would revolve and, and take so much coal in all the time. And, and on sort of a, a elevator belt type uh, uh, deal, and that was a, a great deal there because nobody had to pull the ashes. All you had to do was go over every once in a while and look at your instruments, and it was pretty nice. The reason we're looking at this picture is uh, I was honored to get to make these transitions and and the bottom section of, of the smokestacks going out for the, the exhaust on the on the flues. Uh, all of them were rusted out, rotted out, or, or what. I was an unemployed uh, sheet metal worker. They didn't have enough work for the sheet metal workers, and the youngest ones were taken out and and uh, put out in the machine shop. And uh, usually if you had a craft that you could do, that was what, what kind of job you got. Being that I was a a sheet metal worker, layout man, and such. I made these transitions. Buck Olive welded them on. Me and Bud, the sky just overhauled the fans here. We'll take a picture of the fans first. This is a, a picture of the blowers and the fans that it, it sucked the, the smoke out of the boilers and, and such. Uh, the inside of them uh, had big propellers in them. They had a motor here on this side that you can probably see, uh, run the blowers inside. They didn't give them much trouble or anything like that, but uh, after so long a time of blowing fly ash and everything out, the blades on the, the fans got wore out. We had to put new blades on them. There's a hole you can see in the middle is where you had to crawl in and get them. And uh, uh, that's what we done. We rolled so much and make a piece and take it in and fit it in and then have a welder to crawl in there and he'd weld it in and then we'd make another piece and crawl it. Now I'm going to show you a part of the, the, the fan that was inside. This is one of the fans that were inside the, the blower uh, fan blade. They had big bearings out on the end and the pulleys to run it. We put so many of them in, we made new blades for them, cut, cut the old blades out and put them in. Then you had a, a, a balancing wheel. You set them up in a balancing wheel and roll them and balance them out to make sure that they wasn't out of balance and would run smooth and all this and that. And that was another job that uh, your recording man had here. These are uh, silos they kept supplies in to make glass. Uh, these two were added on later on in later years. Uh, they had an outfit contracted out, come in and put these in. They put them around the clock 24 hours. They had the, uh, the forms made and everything. And they had a guy that would bring in the ready mix and dump the ready mix in. They'd blow a whistle, and every time they'd blow a whistle, uh, they'd move her up maybe three or four inches and jack it up until they got it. They'd done that around the clock. That good old Pittsburgh sign up there, Bobby made that, in case you'd like to know. This here was a, a more or less a, a dump. A trash that was up on top, they could put a hopper down here under this and empty the trash out of the top. These were uh, sand silos. We're going down through here. This is what they call the Rouge House. They got Rouge in there, oh, it was several stuff, red, everything else went on down. And then we go in here where they had the uh, uh, dolomite and uh, you can't see inside, it was on the railroad. Later years, they brought all that stuff in a, a big tractor trailer trucks and they dumped it. Uh, in the, they had underground uh, screws that uh, would take it over to the elevators. We'll take a few pictures of the elevators and stuff. And, and there you can see the elevator, how high they went up and 
they had a lot of belt trouble and you had to go down they had buckets on the, the belt they would get a bucket full and take it up and when it went around just like a water wheel it dumped it out and went down the chutes and stored in the storage and we'll go on down to the next one there uh, to make a long story short uh, they had to open the top of them and look down in them they had a, a foreman or uh, named George Evans that uh, his job was running a batch house. In the process of running a batch house, well, uh, he opened them up and he would go down and measure the batch in them or whatever, lime or sand, dolomite, glass or what. The last ones down were glasses. This is sort of in the dolomite area or whatever you would want to say. And he slipped in the, in the batch and it almost completely covered him up all but his head and after a certain length of time they uh, missed him and got looking for him and found him down in that all covered up but uh, he survived and kept on his job and kept doing a real good job for the company like uh, uh, he was supposed to now you're going down here and see that that pipe coming out of that building there that was a cooling pipe too it, it run up down along the inside of the the bats and blowed a little air in there and kind of kept the schools, the scales cooled off. You can also see a, a stop there on the railroad. I don't know if it's coming in on me or not. Yeah, it's coming in there now. You can see that. That was to stop the railroad cars. If they broke loose, they had a, what they call a winch and a big rope, an uh, inch, two inch, inch and a half. It would pull them railroad cars down through there to what batch he wanted and drop them off. It got away, it went down and hit the stop and stopped. But I was uh, one of the fortunate ones uh, also, as I said, uh, to get to make that uh, duck work there. Here's where your car puller is over here. This is the back side of the machine shop and the little building you see it, it, uh, in the foreground is where they kept the coal for the uh, blacksmith shop. In the old days, they throwed it in that door up there at the top and unloaded out of the railroad car, but later on, they didn't have too much blacksmith work, so they just bought it by the bag and put it in in bags. They also had a, a outfit in there, the a carbide outfit. They made gas to use a burning machine inside the, the factory with. Uh, put so much uh, carbide in, and. Uh, Automatically, it was set up for water to go in to make so much gas. The more gas they used, the more uh, gas they made. Uh, this is uh, the railroads coming in. They had a lot of railroads in those days. When my father first started down here, that was a job he got, working on the railroad, because he was a railroad man with Missouri Pacific. And he come on in and got on the railroad. They had a what they called a dinky track then. And they had it going all over different parts of the... Uh, town dumping uh, uh, old plaster, old glass, filling up holes with it and stuff like that. Every so often they'd have to change the tracks and that was their job. This picture here is, is uh, just more or less a building now. They used to have great big storage tanks that they stored propane gas in in case they needed uh, uh, gas and they didn't have enough gas to go around or they had to cut the gas back down or anything. They would get uh, extra gas from there and operate uh, just as if they hadn't uh, operated before. And then we go on over here and we'll see part of the uh, locomotive shed. Uh, we showed pictures of the old crane. It was probably on this, it'll be on this tape anyhow, sooner or later, so. And then there's the water tank it was on and then going down, this was a dust collector coming out of the the color bin at the batch house. We're by the sand uh, department right now. We're going over and take a, another picture and we're going to show you a picture of the, the winch that pulled the railroad cars down through the... This was one of the winches. They had switches down through the side of the railroad track and they would uh, put the rope on the railroad car and pull it to move them and everything else to dump the sand. These are the sand elevators, I mean the sand silos. Uh, in this area here, uh, that was a winch that pulled them. And the picture you're looking at now is uh, where they unloaded call it. They brought it in on railroad cars too. This was railroad track going down through there. 
and they dumped it and then went over through and then went to a glass crusher and in the process of going down to the crusher and everything else it, it broke the glass up in little particles which made it easier to melt. Uh, they always brought it in railroad cars and dumped it and went down that way. Then if you look over to the left there, or about the center of the picture, uh, is another one of the winches they use to pull the railroad cars here. Uh, if we can, we'll see if we can get this. Uh, this here is a picture of it. And that bell there, if anything went wrong, that bell would ring and they'd know that something was on their track or get out of the way. Move. This was uh, the old locomotive shed. There's nothing left in here, only storage and, and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know what to use this stuff for anymore or anything else, but this is where they brought the railroad trains in to build a car in and get them get them warmed up, get them out on the track and stuff as that. Uh, Clarence Perriman was the number one uh, mechanic at the time. Uh, later on in later years, uh, Cletus Roth come down and took this job over. This was a uh, old mixing room. This uh, V-shaped machine here, uh, they put different uh, chemicals in it and it would mix up and it would revolve around and around like a Ferris wheel. In the process of going around uh, whatever color glass it was going to make, that's what the uh, chemical or whatever it was in the process to mix up to put in the batch. They put them in paper sacks. And whenever they bring over one paper sack, went in a, a bag of mix, maybe two paper sacks. It all depend on how much it was. Uh, we thought we, you'd like to know how they got the color to the uh, glass. This is a, a where they bring the color in and dump it in the chutes and take it up the elevator. We'll take a picture of the elevators. Uh, they had two places. One of them uh, was for clear uh, color, which was. I don't know which one was which anymore. It's been a long time since I've been down there, but uh, this is the other one. They would back a, a dump truck in, dump a load down in the chute, and it would go over and go in the elevator and go up the elevator. I also repanel these elevators, uh, me and Don Stolzer and a couple of riggers. They would pull the plates up and I cut them, and Don Stolzer would weld them in, and they had trap doors right there that if a belt broke or needed buckets on it, you stood out there and watched it run until it, it got to its uh, point of no buckets and then you put new buckets on. Uh, that's about all I can tell you about. This was a control room in the, in the batch house. It was a, a modern, more version of what it used to be. It used to have to go up and dump scales by hand, but this was all automatic. Uh, Don Miller, my cohort here, is uh, in the back room taking some pictures back there, but. Uh, he knows more about all these controls in here than I, that I do, but I was a maintenance man here for a long time. Uh, on the wall there, the, the lights are different colors and such. I don't know if you can see them or not. We're going to move and see if we can see it. This was a, a complete deal to the whole batch house. It uh, showed what scales were dumping and where they was going, what elevators they would use, and uh, which mixer it was going to go to and everything else. They got no smoking sign in here now, but back then they didn't care if you smoked or what you done. But uh, then we're going to move over here and take another picture of some more lights. Uh, right in this row here is uh, uh, lights in a row. It tells you the batch, uh, what lights and what scales are weighing up. Uh, uh, whenever a set of lights will start on the bottom or on the top, and uh, It'll say the scale is starting and weighing up, and when it gets uh, uh, to the point of where it's full, it'll uh, put on the full sign and go on down into the a ready light. And each one done the same thing down through there. I think there was about 16 of them, something like that. And there was three that they used for colored. Uh, they all done the same thing. And then if they had to run by hand, uh, they could come down on the lower part there and the man had the, the machine there, the, the buttons to push and go ahead and, and make the batch by hand if there was a malfunction in something else. And then they had timers for it. And then they had a, a older version of the paneling and it was right across through here. 
Don Miller can probably tell you more about this than I can, but he's got his mouth shut for some reason or other. Now we're going to come back on this side, and I'm going to let Don talk whether he wants to or not. Well, suppose you call what you see up there. I see Solex Cully. When you start with that, that was the maximum part of the batch. We used a lot of old glass run through and mixed with new components to make very high grade glass. Glass could be made from components only, but it, if you used a lot of colic, it made a better uh, batch. Then there was uh, different colored collets, and the check scale is the next item listed there. Then there's another control panel that I don't recognize. These are the actual components of glass. The top one is limestone, second one is sodium nitrate, I think we call that salt cake. Then there was uh, aluminum hydrate. Now, I never wasn't acquainted with that when I was here. Salt cake is the lowest one of those controls. These are dial set controls for any amount that you want. The auto scales automatically shut off when they get to that weight and indicate a light that the scale is ready. These are more components. There's dolomite and uh, lithium carbonate and coal, rouge. Those are real familiar ones. This is another row. This has a rouge scale, a sand scale, and that was a very high grade of sand that we used to make glass. That's what attracted the, the uh, glass making industry here in the first place. There's also sodium ash on this scale. These were different scales. They were set by little dials and you set the weights and that you wanted. This batch house was built in the late 30s. The, uh, it was originally all hand weighed. You, a man would go scale to scale, move a lever to dump the component into a hopper. When he completed the, the full route to the end of the batch house, he came back down and started in and dumped each scale in order and put it on the belt in such order as they wanted it. These uh, belts carried up an elevator and over into buckets. It was carried to the to the old number one and number two tank. Uh, we're in the batch house now. You can't tell much about it because it's it's pretty dark. But we are getting a few pictures, I think. We're going down through the side where they had the scales, and these are the hoppers that come down and drop the the batch mix, whatever it was, into the the belt on the conveyor. In the process, each one had a covered canvas going down in to knock the dust down. You can see all the way down through there now. All the way down to the end, I think. Uh, they used a lot of color and a lot of sand. Uh, this was more or less a, a dust collector system went down through there, uh, took all the dust out. It didn't take the dust out. It had a terrible smell to it, but it still This is a, a picture of a vibrator. Uh, whenever they got so much back in the vibrators and start or shake the stuff down and bring it down into the hopper, fill the hopper up, then it went on down into the, the side and this was another vibrator. And whenever they dump it, these would start up and, and dump on the hopper and make sure it was empty whenever the batch came. This is a, a modern version of the scales they had in after I left out, before they had Fairbanks Morris. These were more instrumented than, and everything else. They're Hal Richardson. They had an outfit from Hal Richardson whenever they'd have any trouble, he'd come down and, and work on the scales and get them lined out. Boston Richards worked on the scales a long time. Ivan Fast was the instrument man that always got to come down and work on them. Uh, after Boston Richard left out, uh, uh, I, myself, Bob Slater, uh, I was a repairman on the scales. If uh, the scale didn't weigh up right or anything, I'd come down and see if everything in the back of it was right or out of cater or whatever went on, and 
and uh, uh, may get called any other day or night and come down and check the scale and, and get it all lined out. They had 50 pound weights and you put so many 50 pound weights on and that way they would tell whether the scale was working properly. These are the old batch mixer. It's what they call the batch house and everything else. This was a, a latest model uh, version of the mixer they had. It rotated around, it had scrapers in it, mixed up. It was a, a German invention. I don't know if we'll be able to see it over here or not, but there's a sign on the wall. Then we're going to go on around and, and see some more. When the mixer dumped, it went over into hoppers, such as this here. It went down into here, along with belt, and went out into the area there. Right there is the belt going over, and it went over into here and dumped down into this part here. In the process, that was for the new float tank. Uh, the part that uh, we were looking at was old mixers for the other part. And going down, you can see down underneath here is the grates and the flooring for the belt going over to the batch house, which crossed the railroad and, and so forth. This was the uh, old mixing type that they had. It would revolve and raise up just like a, it was shaped just like a concrete mixing truck. Only it would raise up and open its mouth and whenever it got up so high, the batch dumped in it and it rolled around and whenever it, it got the batch mixed up, it told you down at the panel board and, and they dumped it and rolled it around, almost in the position it is in here now, only a little bit lower. And then it uh, dumped the batch out and went down on the belt and went into buckets. We was trying to get a picture of the buckets in the gap. This was the old system that uh, dumped the batch down into hoppers. They picked them up with a telfer. Just uh, above us uh, is a telfer. We'll try to see it if we can. If the batch dropped down into this chute here, down into those buckets that's got the handles on them down there, if you can see them, if we're showing them clear enough or not, we, we really can't tell because... But this chute here went down and it went into the, the hoppers. It was mixed up and everything was ready to go. Those hooks that I showed you on there, the two hooks, we're going to go up to the telfer. This is what they called a the telfer. Uh, it had them hooks on it, went down and, and hooked into the buckets. They picked them buckets up with a hoist like, it was a special hoist, it had brakes on it and everything else, and then they, they hauled it down through the area here and set it on top of the, the hopper. It, it put the backs into the tank, it melted it to make the glass. We tried to get a picture of that. This is more, more what we're after than what we're uh, going to get over at the float tank. The float tank is nice, but uh, this here is the old system. This was the area where they kept the hoppers it was filled with batch. Uh, the reason the boards were up there and everything else, it was in the winter time, it was cold down through here. There's no heat or anything in through here, and, and they closed that off more or less to keep it in. In the center part, they would open it up whenever a telfer or, or whatever came through. Uh, they always came through the, the center part there and and went over to the tank. We tried to get a picture of the tank before it's over with, but see there were three tracks. Uh, they kept a spare on one track and a repair place and and whatnot. We're going up. There's one of the buckets that uh, they used to haul the stuff in. In this area here, they used to have it almost full of of different batches. If they was making batch of the one color on one tank and the batch of another color on one other tank. They set them in different spots so they know which one to uh, bring in and, and, and sit on top of the hopper. We're going over there now and take a picture of the hopper. This is a, this is a picture of the old tank system at the head. These are what they call the ports. They would burn out. You could open the door and look in, see how the glass looked on down through the line. They had uh, six of them that you could all look in and see what was going on, see how the glass was doing on down through there. 
they had water coolers in there to keep the side of the tank cooled off and and everything else and on down the line uh, we go down there and then take a picture and and the duck work that you see up there your, yours truly was involved in that again that was the air to cool the top of the tank off and this is the system that did it they had big blowers downstairs and they had blow knocks valves to change the smokestacks from one side to the other side this is a uh, one of the holes that they used to have open to go inside and work on the tank whenever they'd have it down for repair. Uh, there's several of them down through there. Uh, these uh, big beams you see here, they were what they call buck stays. That would hold the whole outfit together. And then they had the iron, cast iron uh, blocks that held the top bricks in uh, on the arch. They had the special farms that they put in and, and laid them bricks on it and then they tighten them buck stays up and pull them in with big uh, tie rods. There you can see the, the big tie rods in there. They put so much pressure on them and that would uh, uh, keep the top from ca caving in. Whenever you get hot and expand, they'd have to do something else with it. And that was a general idea. Underneath the uh, tank, I don't know if we'll be able to see anything under there or not, but they put a cooling system in. Uh, me and uh, John Scottis put that in to, they called them man coolers. On the new tank, they, they also had the same thing in there. And it would keep you a little cool, but it was still hot under them. In that hole there, as you can see, they always took a sample out. They'd stick a, a big long pole in so far in the glass and bring it out and sit it down. And then we'd see how the color was and whether it was doing right or, or just what was going on. They knew just by uh, bringing it out and looking at it, and then they'd let her look on the floor. And it was a, a sort of a, a pretty looking outfit. They converted this over to a, a mini float. Uh, they had a lot of people laid off and wanted to more or less try something, see how it worked, and they converted this over to a, a mini float. I don't know if it, it's awful dark down there. Can you take over there or not? we we'll go over and see. This is a, a general area, the, the mini float that they put in. Uh, the spot you see out there is where the glass came down and went in. They had a, a tin, melted tin, that they filled the, the bottom part of this part of the bath with and let it float on tin down through there. It only made a sheet about four, five, six foot wide. I didn't get involved in that and then it went on into the the layer which went on down to the tank. I don't think it, uh, they done too much with it, but it was more or less an experimental job and kept a lot of people working. This is the top half where the melted tin was at in the, in the bottom half. Before they had the big rolls, it came out and sit in this general vicinity and they would pull the glass on the neural rolls and run it on down through the layer, but they changed all this just to uh, uh, more or less see if they could make a uh, float tank out of the regular tank. These are uh, uh, steam lines that came into the, the old tanks. They had oil conversion burners that they would put in if they couldn't uh, run gas. And then they put in a million gallon storage tank to supply gas to run the plant. It's uh, in pretty run-down shape, but uh, they don't use it, but it's uh, more or less uh, something that uh, out of the past, into the past, or what. This is the old system of setting the buckets on top and letting them fall down into the mix and going into the tank. The bottom part is, is right in here, and the, the rod that you see going in is, is sort of a push rod. It just pushes about six inches, and, and the top part would slide back and forth and drop the mix down into the tank and that's how they got their their stuff into there. This was uh, another view of the way they set the batch up on top in them hoppers that had the two hooks on them and set them in and brought them in and set them down and then they come down and went into into the tank here. Then it went on. If you had to go upstairs and check on anything, you went up them steps and walked down along the top. They had a walkway and walked along the top to see how the 
everything was going. And in the process, they, they made a storage area in here where they made pallets over on the other side and tried to... This was another deal they had. This was what they called a pelletizer. They put the batch in and make it out in little pellets about big as marbles and come on down and then they was going to ship that to different factories and and use it for the batch to make the tank, uh, glass with at different factories. Uh, it seemed, uh, I guess it was more work involved in it than it was actually saving them money. There's old Don down looking at the inside of the tank at uh, where it used to be. They stored pellets in these tanks uh, after they didn't use them anymore and they started to float. Uh, you can see the ports, uh, I don't know. Right in that hole there, shooting in the side, or, or that hole there, shooting in the side, is where they had the burners. It shot the gas in to burn the uh, material to melt the glass. You can see how the rocks, uh, the stones were all melted up from the, the heat and the hot glass down through there. It was uh, tremendously hot. Uh, wasn't one of the more favorable. Uh, Mr. Bill Danks was here as a supervisor. Uh, William Bennett, uh, old Maynard Seifert was here. Uh, Hugh Reed, or oh, just any number of people. Hugh Reed could eat this heat better than anybody that I know of. This is a picture of underneath the, the porch or whatever you want to, want to call them, the, where they changed the gas, the smoke went out one side and back in the other side and all, vice versa. And me and John Scottis made all this of stuff and put it in. It's all insulated and hot as a dickens. You could only work in there maybe 15 minutes or so and then you have to come out. Uh, those were sitting on, on top of a, a big square pipe going through and they had dampers on them. If they didn't use them, we put the dampers and shut them off to uh, keep from uh, wasting too much air. This was the elevator that they took the rolls upstairs to put in the old tanks. Uh, didn't have too many ways. They had a big long wagon that they pushed in carried the roll on it, it was maybe two foot diameter, pulled the glass out of the tank. Down through there is what they called the checkers. Uh, they had to get in there every so often and clean them out and make sure that uh, they were clear so that uh, the gas fumes had come out from upstairs where the burners went in and everything and, and not lay in because of the uh, danger of them blowing up. They took the end out of there, so many bricks out, and and like I said, they had a asbestos suit they wore, and let them go in there in that heat. And whenever the bell would ring, they knew it was time to get out of there, and was uh, bail out, boys, let's go. Uh, the fans you see there was the ones that was on the man coolers underneath the the tank. This is the outside view of the batch house area. And this is the area we walked through showing you the hoppers going over to the area there that they dropped them down into the tank to make the glass with. Then they had a drain pit here. They put it filled with water and went on over and this was uh, the main part of the batch house here. This here was a uh, they had a sort of an elevator there. It wasn't really an elevator, it was a, a hoist, and whatever you had to go to the top to work or something, you could load your tools on there. You didn't have to carry them up steps every time. But the biggest part of the time, you either had to go up there and get that elevator or a hoist and hit it down so that you could have it to, to use it to take up whatever you had to take up. Uh, if this is getting boring, we can quit, but uh, I think my friend wants to keep on going just a little while longer. I'm getting a little on the hungry side myself, but if he can stand it, I'm almost sure that I can. This is a, a picture outside of the crossover belt going over to the new float tank. 
he had to put it up over the air in order to get it over to where they wanted it and still have a underpass for the trucks to get by and supplies and everything else and that's why it's up in the air and over in the tank it's up in the air anyhow so really uh, and these tanks, uh, smokestacks uh, they had a hole drilled in them that they could stick an instrument in take the temperature of the stuff coming out at one time uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see the high lines going across over the top of it or not. Yeah, there they are. You can see the high lines. They said the fumes had eaten the line in two and it fell. And then they had to have them re reworked. But that was a thing of the past. We're now in the, in the close bath area. This was all filled full of tanks. They got one, two, three, four, five of them down in. So if they have trouble in what section they want to want to have you come to, uh, down below in this area here is the bath area that they kept the the motor tin in to to let the glass float on down through here. If we're uh, going down through here going so fast the camera can't catch up with me, but uh, that's work 9, Crystal City, January 21st, 1991. Uh, that's uh, when they were supposed to shut it down, and here's a, a reasonable facsimile of the, the people that were working in this department. This goes on down through the, the tank. They had millions of dollars worth of stuff in there. Uh, there's a light shining in. I'm going to take a walk over there and see what's going on. I'll be back as soon as I can. If you don't find water, it's I thought maybe there was some tin left in there, but evidently they've got it all drained out and, and done a real good job on it. It goes on down through here a long ways. Uh, we'll get down after a while to the field end, and then we'll go to the end where they used to paint the glass and make it different uh, mirrors or whatever they wanted on it. That was in this general area right here. This was a general area, a control room. They had all the instruments in there, told you what was going on in the tank and everything. They had two or three people in there. If anything went wrong, they they blow the whistle or sounded off and they all jumped up and run and got their equipment. This was a, another fire alarm. They pulled the handle down and went ahead and took the push the button and as uh, Mr. Bear said up there in the explanation earlier, how they used to set the alarm off, two toots and one one, three toots and one one. This is more of the control room. Uh, the humming is the transformers. We're not responsible for that part. This is a view out of the float. Ent entrance, trunk entrance, fork truck entrance, supply entrance, or what, over the old factory and such. Uh, it's shady in here, not real bad. And then you'll, you'll see the batch house here. The end of it. These were ventilator fans that more or less suck the fumes out of the batch house with and come on down around. And then the, where they dump the scrap and stuff. This is uh, in the area, general area of the, the mold, melting end of the, the tank. This is the float tank we're on now. Uh, that was the way they came in, went on around this way, and got into the area, the general area. Uh, there's another one of them sad people there telling about the, the tank going to shut down, and these are, are the checkers or ports or whatever you want to call them here. They come on down through the side there, and uh, we're going to scan the whole whole thing if we can. These steps went up 
and over the top to the other side, which was just a hot job going up over the top, but uh, it was a lot quicker going up over the top than it was going all the way around. Uh, there uh, is a window in the tank itself. It looks like maybe you can see in there. I'll check that and we'll get We're now on the inside of the, the tank itself initially where the glass was molded. You can see in spots where they've jackhammered, jackhammered some of it loose and, and everything else. And up there on that end there were the boards or whatever it is and they've got it closed off. That's where they, they put the batch in to melt on the glass. I'm glad it's open here like this so you can see just exactly what it looks like inside. Uh,